Well, good morning, church. We're so glad to see you this morning. We want to welcome you to the harvest. As you're making your way to your seat, I just want to invite you to stand. And I want to introduce to you this morning, um, I have Emma here on my left and Kaylin here on my right. And they're both sophomores and they serve in our rebel-based ministry. And um, as some of you know, I started leading worship when I was 14. These girls are 16. And so to be in a place where we, um, our church, we believe in raising up young leaders, raising up next generation leaders. And so they're here this morning to worship with us. So can we just welcome them to the harvest today? Yeah, yeah, it's so good. I I told them you're not scary, you're you're great. So let's just, let's enter into the, to worship this morning together and just set our eyes on Jesus because he's worthy of all of our praise, amen, amen. We love you, Lord. say I believe. I believe in the blood of Jesus that washes white as snow. I believe that the power of the gospel still makes the broken whole. I believe that the curse of sin was broken when they rolled away that stone. I believe, I believe, I believe. And as I bow before you, Lord, I will rise in confidence. I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. And no matter where I go, and no matter where I've been, I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. the walls will start falling when we fall down on our knees i believe that the lame will go walking and the blind are gonna see i believe that the gates of hell tremble when the church begins to sing hey i believe i believe i believe yes as i bow before you lord I will rise in confidence. I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. And no matter where I go, and no matter where I've been, I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. To every generation Oh look at what the Lord has done Sing it to the darkness That the light has come Oh sing it to the nations And look at what the Lord has done Sing it to the daughters Sing it to the sons To every generation Look at what the Lord has done Sing it to the darkness For the light has come Oh, sing it to the nations And look at what the Lord has done Oh, look at what the Lord has done And as I bow before you, Lord I will rise in confidence that I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. Come on, church. No matter where I go, do you believe it? No matter where I've been, oh, I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. As I bow before you, Lord, I will rise.
give Him praise this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. What a joy it is to be with you this morning here in the harvest. We're just so grateful to be present with you in worship. And this first Sunday after Easter, we are an Easter people. So we continue the celebration of the resurrection this morning. Uh, and friends, what an incredible, incredible weekend uh, last weekend was. Amen. Were you here last weekend uh, and just got to celebrate? <clears throat> We're continuing to celebrate that, and we're happy that you are here this morning as we begin a new sermon series in Joseph, uh, Living the Dream. It's going to be a great Sunday to worship together, and we're just grateful for your presence. If this is your church home, uh, we want to say welcome home. If you are a guest with us this morning, we want to say thank you. Thank you for the gift of your time this morning. Thank you for the gift of your presence. We know that there's a lot of places that you could be today, but we're grateful that you are here. We also wanna say welcome and uh, welcome to all those who are worshiping with us online. We're grateful for your presence as well. For everyone in the house this morning, it always helps us when we register our attendance. Uh, so I wanna encourage you to do that. We always say that we are a better church when we know who's worshiping with us. So there's a QR code on your bulletin. There should also be one um, on the screens if you're online for you to register your attendance. That helps us to serve you and your family um, in, in new and incredible ways. So if you could do that for us, we would uh, really appreciate it. We also wanna offer this morning, uh, if you are in need of prayer, uh, we are a praying church that prioritizes prayer. And so we want to pray with you and for you this morning, the space this morning, your seat has already been prayed for. Our prayer team is here and they would love to pray with you. You can go out into the lobby afterwards and there's banners that say pray here and we would love to be able to share in prayer with you today. Also, if you um, ha say today is the day that you and your family are looking to unite with this church body, um, I would love to talk to you more about membership today. So as well in the back there is a, uh, out in the lobby, there is a banner that says join here. I'd love to talk to you about membership and bring you into the family of faith here at the Woodlands Methodist Church this morning. So just see us after the service. Friends, we have an exciting announcement to share with you this morning, an exciting pastoral announcement. So we're going to uh, put our attention on the screens to hear that announcement at this time. Hi, church. Mark Sorensen here. You know, for 46 years, God has been so faithful to the Woodlands Methodist Church. And today, we're sharing another story of God's continued faithfulness. My entire life has been a witness to the story of God's faithfulness. Several months ago, I felt God stirring my heart to welcome a new way to serve Him and His people in pastoral ministry. For many years, I have been absolutely in love with the work of missions and I could not imagine that God might be prompting me to step away. But because of God's faithfulness, He continued to prompt, and I started to listen and to pray. My prayer was simply this, God, if you're asking me to make a change, you'll need to show me the way. And then only two days later, it became apparent that God has the plan and is truly guiding me through it. Amen, I love that, God has the plan. You know, we have said in our work that missions is the heartbeat of the Woodlands Methodist Church. And Karen has done an incredible job keeping our heart healthy and strong. Time and time again, Karen has shown her faithfulness to God and to his call in ministry. She's showing her faithfulness once again by moving from her current position as pastor of missions to pastor of worship and evangelism. In this new role, Karen will oversee all aspects of worship in our worship communities and on our campuses. Karen will transition to her new role over the next several months so that we will continue to have a robust missions ministry and team supporting our church, the local community, and our ministry partners around the world. Please join me in congratulating and encouraging Karen as she begins this new journey of pastoral leadership in our church. I'm also thankful because as God was revealing this next step to me, he also connected me with a passionate and experienced pastor to come in as the new leader of our missions ministry. After spending time with our pastor parish relations committee and some members of our missions committee, they also agreed that this pastor would be an excellent addition to our pastoral team. So I am thrilled to announce that Reverend Dr. Ashley Goad 
will be coming in as our new pastor of missions, effective July the 1st. Ashley's coming to us from First Methodist Church Shreveport, a church close to my heart, where she currently serves as pastor of missions. You'll hear more of Ashley's story in the coming weeks, but I wanted to share the first part of this update with you now. My friends, it's so incredible to see the continued blessings of God being shown to this incredible church. I'm so humbled to serve alongside pastors like Karen and Ashley, and it's a joy to be your senior pastor. I can't wait to share more good news as we continue to fulfill our mission of reaching people for Jesus, discipling them in faith, and helping those in need. To God be the glory. Yeah. It's certainly something to celebrate this morning, and it's just been a joy and a privilege to watch God work through this transition over the past uh, several months. And uh, Karen is, uh, you guys have heard from Karen many times, and she is just such a gift to our church, so we're so excited uh, that she's uh, taking this leap into this new position. So we're thankful for her and excited, and I invite you to be praying for uh, Dr. Ashley Goad, uh, who is a joy who you will get to meet soon. Um, she, she and her family are beginning to uh, make, make the journey to moving here to the Woodlands, and we're just excited uh, for them. So uh, hold them in your prayers as well. Friends, uh, finally this morning, I just wanna say thank you one more time uh, to say thank you for your generosity. Friends, last uh, weekend, as we mentioned, was an incredible, incredible uh, weekend to celebrate the resurrection together. And all week, uh, we've just been hearing stories of life change that have happened. Uh, over 12,000 people uh, heard the gospel presented, gathered together and celebrate throughout all of our campuses. And friends, uh, that wouldn't be possible without your generosity. So friends, we just wanna uh, say thank you for giving and we wanna invite you to give today as well. Whether you're a regular giver or a first time giver, we just, we just wanna say thank you. There's a couple of different ways that you can give. The, the first way today is since it's a communion Sunday, we won't be passing the plates. So there are uh, baskets in the back that you can leave your physical offering. We also have text to give and online options as well. So we just wanna say thank you for that. A last word on that, today, uh, the first Sunday of the month, we take up a special offering for Society of St. Stephen's. That's uh, one of our ministries here that uh, fulfills the part of our mission of helping those in needs. Society of St. Stephen's um, helps our neighbors here in Montgomery County with immediate needs, such as rent assistance, food, things like that. And so I wanna encourage you to leave a special offering for them as well as you leave today. Friends, it's going to be an incredible day of worship, new series, Communion Sunday. It's going to be special, and we're glad that you're here. So for now, would you stand with us? Uh, greet your neighbor around you. Set as someone you may not know yet, and greet them in Christ's love. Blessed. 
plenty Bless God in the darkest valley Every chance I get I bless your name Bless God when my hands are empty Bless God with the praise that costs me Bless God when nobody's watching Every chance I get I bless your name Bless God when the weapons fall
just one more time. Let's sing praise the Father. And praise Come on. Praise the Spirit. You are glory. Oh, praise forever to the King of Kings. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Praise forever and ever to the King of kings to the one that is lifted up to the one that is exalted above all things king jesus we thank you for the resurrection of jesus and we stand in the power of easter this morning lord we thank you for the gift of your son we thank you for your presence in this place today Church, would you pray with me the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. You may be seated, church. Hey, one more time. Can we give our worship team a hand today? Thank you. So good. Come on. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, you look great. It's good to see you. I don't know about you, um, I took about a three-hour nap last weekend. I'm just going to say it. Easter was a total joy from beginning to end. It was a joy. So all of you, I feel like you should just get a T-shirt when you make it on Easter that says, I both found the empty tomb and a parking spot at the Woodlands Methodist Church. Um, but look, whether you were here, even if you didn't make it, maybe you came last week, it was your first time, and I met a couple that, that are back again this week. We're just, we're thrilled that you're here. And here's the good news, my friends. Here's the good news. The, the same Easter story that I was declaring a week ago in this space is the same story that finds us in our lives today. So I'll just say it one more time. He is risen he is risen indeed, and that is good news. We're glad you're here. Also, can I add this? I just want to say especially thank you to every volunteer, every person that handed out bulletins, stood at the door, flowered across. Thank you for what you do. You are seen and you are valued. All right, we are starting a, I'd say it's a new series. We've been in Joseph, uh, we've been in Genesis rather, uh, since February, we're, we're doing three books this year. It's the first time we've ever done anything like this. I really just felt the, the Holy Spirit. Um, typically, we do 10 different series a year, and series aren't a bad thing, but we just, last fall, we felt the Spirit say, settle in less and more. So I kind of called this year beginning, middle, and end. So we're taking the first part of this year, the first four months, and we're moving through Genesis. We're going back to the beginning. Over the summer, in May, we're going to go through the book of, of Acts on the other side of the resurrection when the Holy Spirit came, the early movements of the church. And then, this is fun, nothing kicks off political and an election year like just preaching through the book of Revelation at the end of the year. No idea where that came from, but get ready. We're going to do that in August up to, uh, up to Advent. But we're kind of wrapping Genesis with the story of Joseph. Here's where we're ending Genesis. A couple really interesting things about uh, Joseph's story, at least I think are interesting too. One, there is more time devoted to Joseph, the person of Joseph in Genesis, than anyone else in the book of Genesis. I think that's interesting. You have Adam and Eve, you have Abraham, Isaac. We've talked about all of these people, not to minimize their story or their impact, but for some reason, the writer of Genesis spends more time looking at Joseph's story than any of the others. That's one, but the second one, and I think this is so relevant and it's so good for us today, is this one. Are you ready? In Joseph's story, you don't see God say a single word. 
You don't see him say a single word. Now, that's not to say he's not moving. It's not to say that he's not speaking, especially today within the context of dreams. But, you know, Adam and Eve, God met with them in the garden. God talked with them. Abraham, God said, Genesis 12, go to a place I will show you, a place that I will cause you to see. God is speaking to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. But in Joseph's story, it's almost like God's voice is absent. And I think there's something to be said. I mean, look, I'm going to be honest. I would love a burning bush. How many of you would love a burning bush? If I walked in the backyard later today and, and one of our, our, our palm trees caught on fire and God started speaking, well, true story, I would probably, I would run. I wouldn't stick around. You know, or like later when I'm, I'm at Goodco and I, just the tortillas in God's face, hey, Mark, don't draw attention. There's something I want you to know. Like I would, I would just love an audible voice of God, but that's the challenge today, right? Faith is how many of us, not to say God doesn't still speak today, but what do you do in these seasons that life is challenging and complicated and maybe, just maybe, you feel like God is absent in your story? Um, there's a, a pastor, Barbara Brown Taylor, and I remember hearing her tell this story decades ago, literally, and she wrote this story in a book called Holy Terror, which is a great name for a book. But she was talking about, she went to, uh, I think it was South Carolina, and she, um, she went to the beach there, and they have these loggerhead turtles. Have you ever heard of these turtles? They're giant, giant turtles. And she showed up, and apparently these turtles were laying their eggs, but she, when she got to the beach, there were these trails, it looked like turtle trails, and it, it was going far away from the beach into the dunes. So she followed the trails. And she finds this turtle that somehow had just gotten lost. And it's noon, it's the heat of the day, and she said the turtle just looked part. So she did two things. One, she called a park ranger. And then two, she went, she got some seawater, and she poured it on the turtle. So the park ranger shows up and says, thank you. Sometimes turtles get disoriented. You saved her life. And Barbara Brown's like, mission accomplished. And then she said she watched the park ranger do the following. He backed up his Jeep. He took out some toe chains out of the back of it. He reaches down. He flips this turtle on her shell upside down. He takes the chains. He ties them to the back of his Jeep and then fastens them to this poor little turtle's front legs. He hops in the Jeep and he says, have a good day. And she says she watches this poor little turtle being dragged on her back, neck like distended over this way, like sand, and she's like, I think I just killed this turtle. <laughs> and she said, the Jeep goes all the way over, goes down to the beach, park ranger gets out, takes the chains off, flips the turtle over, and this is what she sees. She lay there motionless in the surf. A wave broke over her, and then another, and she lifted her head slightly, moving her back legs. Other waves brought her further back to life until one of them made her light enough to find a foothold and push off back into the ocean. Now, it's this next part that I want you to see. She said, watching her swim slowly away and remembering her nightmare ride through the dunes, I reflected that it's sometimes hard to tell whether you are being killed or saved by the hands that turn your life upside down. Come on. Friends, maybe you feel like God is absent in your life, and, and that is the challenge, but that's also why I continue to say God's word is so relevant. This is a story, Joseph's story is one that's thousands of years old, but yet the relevance for us today over these next five weeks, huge. I think God is gonna breathe life into hearts again today. I believe that God is gonna breathe renewed dreams into hearts today. It's been my prayer. So I wanna talk about three things today as we begin. I wanna talk about dreams, I wanna talk about detours, and I wanna talk about the need to live a life that takes the long look. Will you join me in a word of prayer and let's dive in and see what this story has for us today. Let's pray. Father, I am so thankful just for this time that we have this morning, for the breath that we have in our lungs. So I, I just, I, I offer a blessing over those who are here in front of me, maybe those who are in Asbury this morning, those who are watching online. 
That, Father, this is what you do. Your spirit, it is alive and active. Your word is sharper than any double-edged sword. So I just pray that you would reveal a fresh word into us today because, God, this is who you are. Maybe some of us today, we feel like you're distant. Maybe some of us today, we feel like you're absent. But actually today, open our eyes to your nearness, God. We thank you. You are for us. You are not against us. So I ask now, in these next few moments, and especially as we approach the communion table, our family meal, that you would just use me, that you would speak through me, if not through me, in spite of me, so that your will and your words can be heard Father, I I pray over Bishop in the traditional, over um, those, uh, Daniel, Luann, and Loft, over Brent at Wood Forest, over Aaron at Montgomery, Enrique. God, just thank you for these men and women that are declaring the good news today. So, Lord, just continue to move and be glorified, and it's in your name that we say amen. Amen. All right, if you have a a Bible, here we go. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 37. Uh, Prepare yourself. There's a couple stops and starts here in this journey, but truly one of my favorite stories. Here's where we begin. 37 verse 1, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. And this is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph A young man of 17 was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now, I think it's important to stop. A lot of times when we talk about Joseph, when you hear Joseph's story being preached, it's really easy to kind of lean in and kind of paint this picture that he lived a sinless life, that he was perfect on all accounts. We always need to remember the only sinless person that ever lived was Jesus, right? So I think it's important to understand that that Joseph at 17, he had some flaws. It said that He was tending the sheep, and he brought a bad report of his brothers to his father. Now, a bad report, that word, the Hebrew, it translates to whisper, slander, or tale. So I don't know if he was just tattling in this moment. Anybody watch the show Young Sheldon? My wife and I have been watching that, right? Like Sheldon, a couple very big fans in the back. Your hands are very high. Um, You know what I kind of love about Sheldon was he did not hesitate in high school to call out his classmates that were infringing on the dress code. He was just matter of fact. He would tattle on them. I don't know if that's what's happening with Joseph, but I know this. Maybe there's one reason that his brothers were not crazy about him brings a bad report about his brothers who are supposed to be watching the sheep. Let me go a little further. Now, verse 3. Israel, that's Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made an ornate robe for him when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them. They, what? Hated him. And they could not speak a kind word to him. All right, here's here's some more layers for us to unpack in just a moment. I mean, you've got favored, you have hatred, and you have that coat. Favor. One of the things that hopefully you've seen, if you spent some time with this, listening to this Genesis story, is it's really opened up my eyes to generational sin. Like you would find Abraham would make bad choices, and then you would see that Isaac would carry forward the sins of his father. So what we know is that Jacob favored Joseph. But what's interesting about that is when you look at Jacob's story. Now, Isaac and Rebekah had twins, and they were Jacob and Esau. And if you know the story, the word tells us that Jacob loved Esau because Esau was a man's man. He was a hunter. He loved to hunt. He loved game. Isaac loved Esau. That was the thing. It was very, very clear that he favored Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. 
Jacob was just, he loved to stay home in the tent. And what you found, because Jacob lived in the shadow of his brother, because Jacob's dad, Isaac, favored Esau, it kind of drove Jacob crazy. He stole the birthright, he stole the blessing, and ultimately it led him to a place of exile. So if anybody understood what it's like to live in the shadow of someone else, it was Jacob. But here you see Jacob favoring Joseph. So it's no wonder that his brothers hated him because he had that coat. He had that ornate robe is what the scripture says. Now we say it's the coat of many colors. We we don't really know that it had a lot of colors, but we do know that it was ornate. And here's what that means. The actual robe, when you understand, when you unpack the meaning, it would have been a robe that would have extended down to the hands and, this is important, it would have gone down to the ankles. Why is that important? Because the role of the sons was to tend the flock. The role of the sons was to work the field. Question, how much work are you going to be able to do wearing a bedazzled robe that goes to your ankles with the bling J on the front? Anybody? You're not going to get a lot. Yo, that's like a welder wearing a mink coat. It's just not going to work. So here's Joe just walking around sporting this really ornate coat, and his brothers see him, and they can't stand him. Daddy loves him, and they're doing all of the hard work, and he's just living the good life. And if that's not enough, friends, here come the dreams. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they, what? (laughs) Hated him all the more. He said to them, hey guys, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. Isn't that cool? His brother said to him, "Uh, quick question here, Joe. Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us and they say it? (laughs) Do you hear a theme here? This is the third time. And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. And clearly, he could not read a room because here it goes again. He had another dream. And he said, hey, guys, come here. He told this to his brothers. Listen. I had another dream, and this time, the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. Now, what do you see the brothers say? Nothing, because they left the room. They're done. Nothing else. Now, when he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him, basically said, okay, now this has to stop. And he said these words, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? Listen to what's going on in his mind. His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in his mind. It reminds me a lot of Mary, the shepherds, the magi. All of this is happening, and it said that Mary treasured these things. She's pondered these things inside her heart. So Jacob knows that there is something that's happening. Jacob knows that there is something that's going on, and I just want to say right now, I believe there is something that's happening here right now So I just want to say a prayer. Will you just bow your head with me? And I just want to say a prayer while our EMTs are doing some work. In fact, if if you will, just extend a hand towards the center of the room. Father, I don't know what's happening uh, in this moment. But Lord, this is what I know. Um, Father, you're not distant and you are not absent. That God, I know that you are working right now and I just pray over this heart, over whatever medical emergency is happening. I just pray, Father, that there would be healing, there would be a touch of the Spirit, there would be something miraculous. And Lord, right now, I believe you place doctors and nurses, you place people in this room who are surrounding them. So Father, I just pray over her heart, I pray right now that there would be a touch over his heart, that there would be a touch over him. Holy Spirit, we thank you, we love you, 
And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. God's people said amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to continue to go. But if at any point we need to just, uh, we need to pause and, and just let me know. All right? So here's the, here's the context. Here's the story of what's going on. Joseph has all of these dreams. His brothers, they just can't stand him. His father doesn't understand what's going on. So the rest of Genesis 37, basically, it turns this way. Now, I don't know what it is about Jacob, why Jacob thinks this is a good idea, but the brothers have left. They're about 40 miles away, and Jacob says to Joseph, hey, I want you to go and check on your brothers. Now, he's tattled on them once before, but he sends Joseph to go check on his brothers. Joseph leaves as his brothers see Joseph coming from a distance. There's that beautiful, ornate robe, the sparkly, bedazzled Jay is glistening in the sun, and they begin to think, you know what, maybe now now is the time just to kill him. Maybe now's the time just to be done. Reuben, the oldest brother, he interjects, hey, let's not be rash. When Joseph gets there, they rip his robe off of him. They throw him into a cistern, a well. Joseph is crying out for help, and his brothers just eat a meal, and they plot what they're going to do with Joseph. End of story is this. They sell him into slavery, Egyptian slavery. They take the robe that they have ripped off. They shred it to pieces. They kill an animal. They dip the robe in the blood, and they bring it back to their father, Jacob, and they say, Dad, bad news. I think something terrible has happened to Joseph. He's dead. And Jacob just loses it. He tears his clothes. He goes into this state of mourning because he believes in Genesis 37 that Joseph's story is done. And that is where we end the scene today. Thanks for coming. Good night. Have a great week. All right, no. What do you do with that, right? Like, what do you do with that? Remember, God is not absent, but what do you do in these seasons that all of a sudden you don't know if you're being saved or killed by the hands that have flipped your life upside down? Three things, dreams, detours, and taking the long look. I just felt a really strong inclination from the Spirit today in relationship to dreams that someone needs to hear this. If, if you're in this room and you're breathing, and I pray that you are, you need to know that God has a plan and God has a purpose and God has a dream for you and your life. Now what you need to know about that dream is this, not everyone is gonna be excited about the dream that you have. You very well could be called to do something that makes no sense. It very well could be a dream that God has placed in your heart. You need to know, not everyone is always going to be a cheerleader for the dream that you have. But my friends, here's the word for you today. The world can take off your coat. The world can rip your coat into shreds. But it cannot remove the dream that God has placed inside your heart. It cannot remove the dream that God has placed inside your heart. There's a, a passage of scripture that's always been so important to me. I feel like the 28 years of ministry, I mean, I wish I could tell you I got into ministry and I had a plan. I had no plan. I just felt God calling me to take one step and then another step and then another step. And a verse that's been so important to me is Jeremiah 29:11. You know, I, I, I put this one to memory early on. I still, to this day, every week, I'll find a verse, and I just write it down. I'm still practicing scripture memorization. Friends, I cannot encourage you enough. Put scripture to memory, because the more of the word you put up here, the more the Father will speak to you here. These words come back, and Jeremiah says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And then you will call on me, and you will come and pray to me, and I'll listen to you. And you'll seek me, and you'll find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. Now the context here, of course, is that the Israelites had lost their way and they're back in Babylonian captivity, but yet in a, a scene for the Israelites, God's chosen people where they feel like they're at the bottom of a cistern and they feel like it's dark and they don't know where God is, God draws near and says, hey, I am for you, I am not 
against you. You need to remember that in those seasons that maybe your dream is being challenged. Here's what I've found in my life is that whenever the dream is challenged, when things are happening and you don't understand what's going on, don't get distracted by the detours. Write that down. Don't get distracted by the detours. Um, Confession. About a month ago, I had this visitor to my office. Um, It was this tiny, sweet little bird that showed up. He perched six panes in one of my office windows in the upper left-hand corner. In fact, I got a picture. Look at that sweet little guy. Just looking in with that big bird eye just staring at me. Hey, good morning. And I was like, oh, that's so sweet. Hey, buddy. And then the very next day, I heard this little tapping on my window, and he came back, and I was like, that's so sweet. And the next day, this little tapping on my window, and then the following Sunday, There was a giant crow outside my window. And then the following week, the same bird started coming back, and then he started telling his friends, listen to me, four weeks in a row, this bird nonstop has been tapping on my window. Now look, telltale heart, anybody familiar? No one is buried under my office floor, but it's driving me crazy. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Next picture, That's Reverend Drew Essen's window. Right catty corner to mine. Y'all, I'm trying to give a distraction here. Like, give me a break. Look, if by chance you pull up onto our church property later this week and there's a giant hoot owl, you know those porcelain beautiful owls outside my window, don't judge me. Don't buy into the distractions. If anybody could have ever played the victim card, it was Joseph. If anybody could have ever played the pity card, if anybody could have ever turned into envy and animosity and hatred and bitterness, if anybody in a well, God had given him a dream. In fact, God had given him the whole story. What Joseph got in Genesis 37 was what Joseph was gonna understand in Genesis 50. But one of the things about Joseph that you never see is he never curses God. He never lashes out He just trusts in these seasons that I don't understand what's happening, but this I do know. God is working in ways that I see and even in ways that I don't. Don't be distracted by the detours. There's a verse I love, I quote it all the time, John 15, five, where Jesus says this, I'm the vine and you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you're gonna bear much fruit, for apart from me, you can't do a thing. And I've quoted that so many times But you know what I don't always quote that I felt convicted about? The context of that, John 15, verses one and two. Listen to what Jesus says. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. There are times that God places a dream in your heart, but some things have to die in order for that dream to come to fruition. There are dreams that God has given you. There are passions that he has given you. But my friends, there is also a pruning season that happens. We have these rose bushes, and every year I prune them so far back, and I'm just positive I've killed them. But every spring, I am reminded they come back and they're more beautiful than they were the year before. Don't resist the pruning. Trust God when things, sometimes there has to be a funeral so something new can be born in your life. You don't understand the whole picture, but trust God. That's why Jesus goes on, verse three, to say, you're clean because of the word I've spoken to you, so remain in me as I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It has to remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. What you hear Jesus say over and over and over in John 15 is this, remain. Remain 
when dead branches are cut away. Remain when things are challenging and difficult and maybe the world isn't cheering your dream. Remain in those seasons, keeping the long look, what that means. Let me spoil this story for you. Don't you just love people, that movie you've always been wanting to see and someone just ruins the ending? You just love those people. I just pray for them, but but, you know, you just, you love them. Well, look, the long look is this, Genesis 50, 20, There will be a moment, this is the very last sermon we're gonna give in this series, I'll come back and I'll unpack this a lot more. But at the end of Joseph's story, this is what he says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So let me encourage you, a verse maybe, that would be worth putting to memory this week is Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things, not some things, not the things that we love, but Paul says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God's given you a purpose, he's given you a plan, he's given you a dream. Don't get distracted by the detours. The thief comes to kill, steal, destroy, but Jesus says, I've come so that you might have life and you might have it to the full. Have the long look in those seasons. And I can't think of a better better word to bring us to this table. Friends, Jesus met with his friends and they were all going to be martyred. They were all gonna find a really difficult time on the other side of the crucifixion and the resurrection, but he, he brought good news. He broke bread and he gave thanks and he said, this is my body, which is given freely for you. I want you to take it and eat it and do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup that was before him. He blessed it. He gave thanks and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this and as often as you do, do this in remembrance of me. So my friends, we come and we are reminded the body has been given, the blood has been poured out. His grace and his mercy meets us here at this table today. I'm gonna say a prayer over these elements as I do. If you're serving in Holy Communion this morning, if you will come, take your elements and go to your station at this time. But right now, will you bow your heads with me and let's pray as those who are serving come forward. Father, thank you for this word. God, I just ask right now that you would bless these elements, the bread, the cup, that they may be for us the body of Christ as we are a people who are redeemed by his blood. Father, I thank you for this story that meets us today. Sometimes it's hard to tell whether we're being killed or saved by the hands that flip our lives upside down, but this we know. God, you are working all things for good according to your work that is happening within us. So we thank you for that. We thank you for this meal. And it's in the name of Jesus we say, amen. You know, if you're new to the church, um, this is an open table. You see four corners here, but the truth is, God's table, it wraps all the way around the world. All are welcome who recognize what Christ is doing in their life. We take it by um, intention, meaning you will take the bread, which is gluten-free, and you will dip that into the cup and you will receive it at that time. We do have self-serve communion cups that are here at the front if you prefer to use those as well. My friends, the communion table is open. Let us come forward and receive as the ushers instruct. body of Christ given for you.
friends, thank you for your presence here today. I just want to celebrate one more time. I mean, our, our young worship leaders this morning. Now, just be careful, though, because Mark and I also both started as worship leaders, okay? And then you never know what God's going to do with your life, okay? Um, but we're just thankful for you all and just so honored that, that you're here. Friends, I also just wanted to share, uh, thank you for your prayers this morning. Our, our, the gentleman uh, is doing well. Um, he's doing well. So praise God. So friends, as, as you go, we just pray that the Lord blesses you and keeps you, that he makes his face to shine upon you and is gracious to you now and forever. And friends, we will see you next week. Thanks so much. We'll see you soon. Amen.